A thin endometrial lining doesn't matter what's too thin and what should you know or what can we do? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I love educating you about your body, how it works, how reproduction works and what you need to know to be your best advocate if you happen to find yourself on the side of going through fertility journey. Would love it if you would subscribe to the channel and stick around. Today I want to talk about a thin endometrial lining. This can be just something that happens and this can be something that is caused and this does impact reproductive outcomes especially when we're doing IVF. The endometrial lining, the endometrium is the innermost layer of the uterus. This is what grows and sheds when you have a period. This is essential to implantation of an embryo. So some people have a thin lining and you might never know it. Like people get pregnant in the wild and we don't know what their lining is. Some people have a thin lining and we know it. And sometimes our thin lining is caused by something such as having a history of uterine surgery or Asherman syndrome, scar tissue, fibroids removed, etc. That is one of the most common causes in addition to long-term use of contraceptives that include progesterone. So whether that is the Depo-Provera shot, whether that is a Nexplanon, whether that is an IUD, like an IUD with progesterone, or even continuous oral contraceptives, a combined pill with estrogen progesterone that you take every day and you don't bleed, that chronic progesterone exposure is great. You're not going to get pregnant, but it can thin the lining over time. This is an advantage if you're not trying to get pregnant because you'll bleed less, lose less blood, feel better, have less cramps. But now when you want to get pregnant and you have a thinner lining, this could be a cause. The other circumstance where we see a thin lining is as we get older. It is well demonstrated that as we age, our lining is thinner. And this is probably just in natural cycles because when you have fewer eggs, you ovulate sooner, your cycles tend to get shorter. There's less estrogen exposure compared to progesterone in the cycle. And that is causing you to have a thinner lining. Clinically, you might notice Thin linings might have an increased tendency to bleed, so you might have some spotting, but you also might just say, hey, my period is lighter or shorter than it used to be. When we do IVF, it is really common to measure the lining. So you will see us measuring that lining when we are doing IVF cycles, when we're doing ovulation induction cycles, and specifically where we're the most crazy about it is in embryo transfer cycles, because there definitely are some numbers that we are trying to look for. I'm going to give this huge disclaimer before I dive into a little bit of the data about thin lining and what it means and what we can do is that almost every fertility doctor I know, including myself, will take somebody who has a organized, pretty lining, which is trilaminar over somebody who has a thicker but disorganized lining every day. And so when somebody talks about organized or trilaminar, this is the architecture or how organized it is. Trilaminar is this appearance right here where you have these three white lines almost in parallel. Like you can look and you can see three lines in parallel. Perfection. So that's what we're looking for. A homogenous lining is something that is more irregular or solid or totally bright. You only get this trilaminar appearance when you've had estrogen only exposure. So if you ovulated, you're going to have a progesterone looking lining, which is more homogenous. And this is why we don't measure the lining after you start progesterone. So in an embryo transfer cycle, you are going to grow a lining one way or another. The two main ways that I talk about in the embryo transfer video is that you can take estrogen, okay? That can be oral, vaginal, patches, injectable, and then you do an ultrasound and then you start progesterone, or you can ovulate, whether that's with medications or naturally, and grow a lining, and then from growing that lining, you will have the appearance. So one way or another, the uterus needs to see estrogen, whether it's endogenous or exogenous, and that's going to grow the lining. The lining is measured before the progesterone starts. And then the implantation window is based on progesterone. So that implantation window is going to be for the vast majority of people on the sixth day of progesterone exposure, which mimics what the body does naturally. If you're doing a fresh IVF cycle, then we consider the day of the retrieval as the first day of progesterone exposure and your transfer is five days later. And so your lining is measured at the last visit before you're triggered. So you're measuring the lining when you feel like you have maximum estrogen exposure, but before progesterone 
naturally or exogenously is started. What are we looking for with that lining? So there's a few different studies out here to guide us. One, it looked at fresh versus frozen cycles. So in a fresh cycle, you have multiple eggs all growing the lining. In essence, this is your peak natural estrogen you could ever have. And this study showed that pregnancy rates decreased for every millimeter below eight millimeters. However, in a frozen cycle, it looked like the magic number was seven. So in a frozen embryo transfer, for every millimeter below seven, you had a decrease of pregnancy rates and live birth rates. And this was a study published in 2018 in human reproduction, and it looked at over 40,000 cycles. So we had really a nice high number of evaluation. Importantly in this study, there was not an association with pregnancy loss with linings that were thinner. So you might have a lower chance of getting pregnant, but that did not impact the loss rate. Also importantly, even though statistically different, the clinical pregnancy rate was not markedly lower. And I do have some patients who are never going to achieve a lining of seven. That may be the arbitrary goal for the population, but for each individual person, we're really trying to get the best that you can. A good marker for me is what did you achieve in your fresh cycle? If your lining was thin in your fresh IVF cycle, I'm unlikely to be able to get it extremely thick in your frozen cycle because again, that's when you had all of these eggs making the most estrogen. So in some patients, they just are going to have a thinner lining. All right, and then this is the data from the frozen transfer since that's what I do more. I want you to look at this really closely. So again, these rates are all a little bit lower because they're not doing genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. But greater than eight millimeters, we had clinical pregnancy rates of 38%. And it was extremely the same in the seven millimeter category. So that's why they said no difference. After that, it started to drop. So in the six millimeter range, 31%, five millimeters, 28%, four millimeters, 27%. But just saying 27 to 31 is not zero. So it's a little bit less than 38, but it's not like you're not going to get pregnant. So I want to make sure we don't feel that we're not going to get pregnant. And then we have another study looking at endometrial thickness as a predictor of outcomes in fresh and frozen transfer cycles. And this was looking at 1500 cycles, so slightly a smaller cohort. But this study actually looked at what your lining was in your fresh cycle to then use that to predict your success in your frozen cycle. So as I was saying before, your max lining is likely in that fresh cycle. So they're trying to use that to say, who's going to potentially need more intervention. So in this study, we saw with increased thickness of the endometrial lining an increase in pregnancy rates and live birth rates. So there was actually a higher loss rate in patients who had a thinner lining. Here's a chart just looking at basic endometrial thicknesses in fresh cycles and frozen cycles. And you can just see, even though this is very complex, that if you look at the categories of live birth rate, the number is higher in both groups, the thicker the lining is. Importantly and interestingly in the study, endometrial thickness in your IVF fresh cycle had a higher prediction of success if it was greater than 8.75 millimeters than did whatever your thickness was on your frozen transfer. And the hypothesis here is that that's your maximum and potentially we should be intervening in those frozen cycles to either do something different or to try to help those patients achieve a thicker lining. One last thing that the study showed us was that that pattern did matter. So having that organized trilaminar pattern was associated with an increase in pregnancy rates. And then there was a study published in Fertility and Sterility looking at what the optimal endometrial thickness was for fresh and frozen cycles, looking at 96,000 cycles. So a very, very big study. And then right here in this table, we're looking at outcomes in that frozen embryo transfer cycle based on thickness. They went to greater than 18 or less than six. You can look at the clinical pregnancy rate drops throughout the categories, live birth rate drops, miscarriage rate increases. So you have an increase in miscarriage as the lining starts to get thinner, but specifically just at that very thin group, less than six millimeters. And then a few studies have started to look at how your lining compacts, like going from max thickness to compacting after progesterone starts, but the data has been mixed. Is there any utility to rechecking that? And what does that show us? So these studies all pulled together are telling us that the lining does matter, probably both in the fresh and the frozen cycle, they're correlated. But what can we do about this? From a protocol standpoint, one is we can change the method or the duration of estrogen exposure. I will say I have a lot of patients who respond really nicely to vaginal estrogen. So whether patches or oral estrogen might get metabolized differently, putting the same oral estrogen pill vaginally 
often just gives more estrogen to the source and I can just see an improvement in certain patients. Some patients benefit from vaginal Viagra. So the same Viagra that men use, utilizing that to try to increase blood flow to the uterus to see if that can help improve the lining. Studies have shown that vaginal Viagra is something that can be utilized. Other options can include changing the protocol. So for a lot of people, doing something different will get you a very different outcome. And so the big difference here is your exogenous, meaning I'm taking estrogen to grow the lining, versus endogenous, I can grow a follicle. So sometimes you need help with letrozole or with gonadotropins like FSH or LH, but that's considered a modified natural cycle. And then you have a natural cycle where you truly just ovulate on your own. Some people too respond much better to their natural lining. So somebody with a really nice lining in their fresh cycle, which is all endogenous, then we're doing a controlled or medicated cycle and I don't love their lining. One of the first things I'm going to do is consider, should we do a modified natural cycle? Is that something that's going to get us a lining closer to where we want to be? There are some other things that potentially based on your circumstance, I mean, I often consider a hysteroscopy to make sure I'm not missing a piece of scar tissue or uterine abnormality or something that could be contributing to having a thin lining. Sometimes there's some experimental stuff like PRP or growth hormone that potentially can be used that is being studied right now. And then what can you do naturally? So we really are going to focus on improving blood flow. That is typically the number one thing we can think about about how that will help the lining is that if you get better blood supply to the uterus, that estrogen is going to help proliferate that lining better. And so regular exercise, but moderate. We don't wanna be constricting things off, getting good sleep, avoiding anything that restricts blood flow like high levels of caffeine or nicotine, um, thinking about acupuncture. Acupuncture can be something really nice to both decrease stress, but potentially improve blood flow and circulation as well. And then your body weight. We see people who are too thin often have a hard time growing a thick enough lining. And similarly, if you're overweight, those fat cells are making additional estrogen and can also interfere with the growth of the lining. So trying to aim towards a normal BMI. When it comes to supplements, probably the things that have the most evidence supporting them are going to be vitamin E, L-arginine, and melatonin. But you're also going to want to think about taking a vitamin D just in everybody, making sure you have a prenatal vitamin on board with folic acid and some omega-3 fatty acids. Ultimately, if you end up having a thin lining, I don't want you to feel like there's a lost cause. None of those pregnancy rates were zero. However, a good question is to ask what was your lining in your fresh IVF cycle when you grew all those eggs so that you can compare because that might be the best you can do. If that was on the thinner side, then as long as it's organized and it's close to that, I go forward. If that was significantly thicker than what we're seeing in a frozen transfer, I'm considering switching the protocols, canceling, doing further investigation, adding in something different. And those are questions I want you to ask as well. I hope this video helped you ultimately taking the best care of your body, decreasing inflammation, improving blood flow, getting good sleep, taking your vitamins. That's what you can do. You did not cause a thin lining. If you have one, trying to figure out if there is a cause is important, but otherwise knowing and asking the right questions to be a good advocate for yourself. All right, friends, thank you so much for being here. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast, or you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks.